This is simply just a 15 second lead in for those watching the replay as we wait for ads to kind of play on this end. So when we decide to go live, everybody catches us from the beginning. And with that, we say welcome in everybody to yet another Thursday, another car guy and six fan show. It is the automotive gold standard it is the gold standard automotive YouTube subscriber hangout. I always butcher it. So with that. I'll just introduce myself as your host, Grant Tommy, straight six fan, and ship it over this way. Yeah, so he, he did screw that up a little bit, guys. It's uh, Jason here, who is the car guy of the car guy and six fan show. Welcome to the gold standard of YouTube automotive chat. Let's do it. Let's start the show. We're getting ready to do part two of the AMC story. And guys, we had so much fun with the part one that... Like, we're just ready to dive in here and, and read notes that I can barely read because my handwriting is illegible. But, uh, Grant, why don't we see uh, who's in the chat and uh, introduce everybody and see uh, if we can get the show going here. Yeah, absolutely. So, so far, uh, popping up in the chat, we have Trucker Dave, we have Lopar Din, King Eric the Greatest of all, Mustang Guy 6501, as well as Grimm's Auto Service, and... Just so you guys don't think that Jason and I are just passing off BS on you guys for this story. Just a reminder, this is basically the crux of our um, our research. It's this uh, storied independent automakers book by Charles K. Hyde. I will leave a link in the description below uh, on, here on YouTube. If you're listening to us on the podcast on SoundCloud the next day, uh, you won't find a link down there. So just a little extra motivation to... Find your way over to our channels on YouTube. Of course, I'm Straight Six Fan. That's S T R A S I X F A N. And Jason, how can the uh, listeners on SoundCloud locate you on YouTube? It's pretty easy. It's the old car guy, and it's O L D E C A R R G U Y. Um, not very hard to find us. We uh, we're all over the place. You'll find us popping up on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook. We've all got pages there that we share a lot of our stuff on, and. Uh, Grant has a little bit of a uh, raffle giveaway he wants to talk about before we jump into the uh, bread and butter of tonight's show. So, Grant, why don't you go ahead and tell us what you got over there? Yeah, before we dive into part two of the history of the American Motor Company, uh, just a reminder, anytime I'm hosting the Car Guy and Six Fan show, uh, I raffle every $1 spent in Super Chat gets you one entry to win this Flowmaster 50 Series Delta Flow Muffler, I am limiting it to the lower uh, 48 US. Um, you can risk it if you're from Canada, you can try, um, but I have no guarantees I can sh ship internationally too well for cheap. So at the moment we're saying lower 48. Um, I'm sure if someone from Alaska or Hawaii gives me money, I'll figure out how to ship it there too. Uh, internationally, we have grandfathered in uh, uh, street. Ooh. What is his name? Streetcar culture. Streetcar culture. Because uh, I didn't list those rules out of the gate. But anyway, enough about that. We do want to pick up where we left off from part one of the story of the American Motor Company history. And so if you guys missed that, just go back down through our playlist. Go find us on SoundCloud. Part one, as you may remember, was uh, talking about the histories of how Hudson and Nash Motor Companies came to form American Motor Company. And where we left off was with the George W. Romney era. And so we kind of went a little long last time, got cut a little short. So we just wanted to book in that before we kind of pick things up. So right around 1958, um, that was kind of a banner year for the American Motor Company, despite being a recession in the U.S. Um, the American Motor Company redesigned the Rambler, and it was a hit. You might remember the funny quote we left off of the George Romney in our last episode about kind of poking fun about how big the American car had been, had become. And, you know, much as when Hudson tried to release the jet, Nash tried to release the Metropolitan, they were trying to live in the niche market of the small car world, and that was just the wrong time. But 1958 proved to be the right time. So the Rambler alone, they sold 363,000 units, which meant that represented 6% of all automo the whole entire automotive market. So let that sink in for a bit. And it was so wildly popular that the big three started to take notice. And it was because of the 1958 Rampler that you found Ford making the Falcon, 
uh, Chevrolet with the Corvair, Plymouth with the Valiant. Um, and so really the big three were trying to play catch up to the sales. And so, you know, Romney, leadership in AMC, they kind of rode that wave to about 1960 when the, 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 the big three started releasing their cars. And they started to kind of see, they were taking a hit. So by 1961, um, AMC hadn't really refreshed anything that much, and uh, the market was a lot more competitive. And so as we continue on, it'll be this continual up and down wave that they were trying to, to, to ride. Um, but the George W. Romney era comes to an end in 1962 because he kind of took an interest in politics. So he entered his name in for to become the uh, the governor of the state of Michigan in 1962. So that kind of takes us right up to there, to the threshold of what was the pony car slash muscle car era, 1963. And that, well, that's where Jason takes over. Yeah, so one of the things that you're going to find uh, when we start talking about the history of um, AMC specifically uh, is the leadership. Uh, the leadership took so many ups and downs, uh, turns over the years that when Romney went out um, and Abernathy uh, came in, and pardon me for not knowing his first name, uh, but we'll just call him uh, Abernathy just because that's the easiest way to uh, represent him. Uh, he had a completely different style on how he wanted to run the company. Uh, in 62 and 63, there was a couple of things happening for AMC. They were coming off some really good record years as far as sales go. Uh, they had their first V8 car. The Rambler was named the car of the year uh, with uh, you know nearly half a million dollars uh, in sales between uh, 63 and uh, sorry 62 and 63. Uh, the following few years after that was uh, showing losses in profits between 64 and seven. Um, one of the big things that uh, AMC always tried to do was become uh, market share uh, in, in the car industry between GM, Ford, and Chrysler. And uh, at one point, they went from 6% down to 2.8. Um, so if you're looking at a big company like AMC, uh, you know, or sorry, the small company from AMC, looking at the big companies of GM, Ford, and Chrysler, thinking, I want a piece of that pie. You're not going to do it by uh, dropping sales. So you've got to come up with something big, something uh, that's going to com uh, be competitive with everything else and that's when Abernathy had the idea to market the AMC Marlin. Um, he had a lot of the key ingredients in place but a couple of things. One, the car was just way too big and it was ugly. Um, the first year, 65 for the Marlin, sold 10,000 plus units. 66 they sold 25% of that with virtually no changes to the car. Um, that was huge uh, in the market when you know Ford had the Mustang and, and uh, Chrysler had the, uh, the, their Plymouth had the Barracuda. Those were who they were targeting with this Marlin and it was a total flop. Um, you know, it was big out front because people thought, oh, this is going to be the big, you know, the next big thing and, and it wasn't. So, um, there were other struggles that AMC had to uh, uh, kind of jump in and be a part of with the big three, and that was warranty. Uh, so in order to be a little bit more competitive and attract people to the showrooms, uh, they had to match the warranty for Ford and GM. So that was huge as far as cost goes, um, but it was downfall because, I mean, they didn't have the quality in AMC products that Ford, GM, and Chev had. So that brings us up to basically 1967, Grant. What um, what are we going to do as far as uh, heading in the direction after that? Yeah, so with the warranties, like Jason talked about, having to compete with the, the big three when they really didn't have the resources, um, amongst the failed attempt of the Marlin that Abernathy got them in, um, well, that torqued off the board of investors, and so gone is Abernathy, and in comes Roy D. Chapin, Jr. or Chapin. You might recall I struggled with that name in part one. Well, yes, he is the son of Roy D. Chapin from Hudson. So, you know, again, there's this family lineage. There's this, even though it's uh, an automotive history that, you know, kind of had some 
we'll call it a family tree, if it will. It, it still has some direct lineage with Chapin Jr., but um, he in- got to inherit a $95 million um, bank debt, bank, bank load debt, uh, strung out over many different banks. Um, so he had to come up with a plan r- right out of the gate in 67 how to uh, how to make that up. And, and actually, they were able to, by June of 68, they had all those bank loads paid off. They sold off that Kelvinator brand that, you know, kind of was inherited through the Nash lineage. And um, it was around this time, too, that um, he hired a key designer, Richard A. Teague. He was a former Cadillac and Packard designer that really helped, you know, again, it's kind of timing is everything in this situation as well. And so... With that came a little car known as the American Motors Experimental uh, from 1966 New York's Auto Show. Uh, that, if you haven't guessed it by now, that is essentially what became the AMX. So uh, AMC, while late to the muscle car scene, they did roll out the the Javelin and the AMX. You know, two cars basically shared a lot of parts together, uh, both available the 290, 343, or 390 V8. And um, America's youth, they they took notice. And in the first year, they sold 55,000 Javelins. And um, the, finally, AMC was starting to like get a little piece of that muscle car pie, if you will. And so but to, under Chapin's leadership, um, they, he also got AMC back into competitive racing um, because they weren't just dealing with compact cars anymore uh so they actually were pretty competitive in the trans am series the um, you know the mustang won in 1970 won six races but the amx won three so you know pretty good for the number four the number four manufacturer to be able to do that um also other cars of this era they decided to finally throw some speed parts at the old rambler so you might remember the scrambler as they call it the supercar the sc rambler so the hearst four speed um but You know, much like any of the big three, they also had to now start struggling with a little thing called emissions. As, of course, CAFE standards, the corporate average fuel economy, came into play in, uh, what was it, the kind of mid-60s. And then the Motor Vehicle Air Pollution Control Act of 65 and then later 1970. um, This would just kind of be one of those things that um, was just another hurdle of a small company to to handle so as you know the decade clock ticks over to 1970 they begin to have more struggles yeah so guys don't think for a second that vw uh, was the only one getting caught falsifying emission standards for their vehicles uh back at the uh the turn of the decade in the 70s uh amc was right there too that they were caught falsifying federal uh, regulation emissions uh, for California and of course as we all know California has uh, very strict regulations to the population and so these are some of the things that car manufacturers have to abide by uh, cheating the rules a little bit isn't something that's just been going on for the last few years it's been going on since the automobile uh, since regulations started coming into play they were trying to play around those rules a little bit and you know we move away from emissions just for a brief moment, and we, we kind of talk a, a little bit about the warranty and how AMC had to jump up and stand behind their cars more than they had hoped they had to, uh, but to stay competitive. Well, in 1972, they took a step forward and they said, we want to not only become status quo, we want to raise that bar. So what they did was they created what's called an extended warranty or a buyer protection plan warranty. Uh, they were covering everything for the first year, or I think it was 12,000 miles. Brake pads, filters, spark plugs. Like, the tires were about the only thing that they wouldn't cover under this buyer protection plan that they wanted people buying their cars. And it was this leg up that allowed them to gain a little bit more traction with the consumer market. People wanted the biggest bang for their buck. You know, if they were looking for the speed or they're looking for style, uh, maybe they didn't think they were getting it with AMX. But at the end of the day, if they knew that they could get someone to stand behind it, that's exactly where they were heading. So moving into the 70s, 
Um, you know, we've talked about the AMX and how that really was a turning point and the scrambler uh, for AMX to kind of join into the speed or performance side of automotive building and, and manufacturing. Then came the uh, you know the, the oil crunch or, or whatever you want to call it where things were starting to become we need more fuel economy we need more uh, you know cars are better on fuel so in 1975 you guys all know what came about it was the Pacer and Pacer was a huge hit it was their economy car and they were selling hundreds of thousands of these cars and I made a note uh, here that says the biggest downfall for AMC by producing this Pacer was that it was stealing sales from the Hornet series of cars and the Gremlin. Um, they were so popular, they were so, f they, were, they were good on gas, um, you know, these are the cars that husbands bought their wives and you know, it was the family grocery getter or it was, you know, the next in line as opposed to going out and grabbing the great big station wagon. Uh, they were popular cars and even to this day they're still quite a cult following on uh, on the pacer so this is where you know we brought ourselves into 1975 uh, one thing that we didn't talk about uh, which we're going to back up a little bit and Grant's going to help me on this uh, because uh, we're I'm losing a little bit of traction as far as my notes go here we didn't talk about the acquisition of Kaiser Jeep yeah and so that's what makes 1970 kind of one of those pivotal years because that was the year in which the sale was made final and as Jason yeah, skipped ahead to talk about the Pacer, of course, the Gremlin 2 was, was the first attempt at making a sub or a compact car that got good mileage. And, and they, again, kind of much like the Rambler was in 58, they did beat Ford and Chevy to the market. And they started getting the Gremlin out ahead of nine, um, the Pinto and the Vega. Uh, and so they, they kind of benefited from sales like that. But really, it would long term be that acquisition of Kaiser Jeep. Uh, inking that deal right right around in 1970 that would help elevate their company profile once again and so uh jason didn't have a whole lot of jeep notes on my end but hopefully that was enough to help you <laughs> regain your regain your spot maybe well it was and i think uh I mean, we are, we're getting to the point where pretty much everybody knows kind of the history because most of us are old enough to remember well i'm old enough to remember but um we, you know where where GM or sorry where AMC came into play with uh, with Jeep. So one side that we didn't really talk about with the acquisition of Jeep was their AM general side of things, which is everything that they built for uh, the military uh, was a huge uh, production numbers that the general public just didn't see. So when you saw the Jeep and the big trucks, the big you know five ton trucks or whatever rolling down the road, these were all AM general trucks. And uh, this was a huge part of the sales for AMC of the time, and eventually led into things like uh, tour busing and city buses and all that sort of thing. And AM General stayed around for quite a long time, making things like the Hummer. Uh, so as we kind of lean into the late 70s, uh, you know, we don't just sit there and talk about AMC. We also got to look at AM General a little bit because they were a huge part of the success of AMC. Uh, getting them through the 70s. Well, and I just looked it up because I have the the other interesting thing about this book, which again, I highly recommend if you guys are interested in history of the American Motor Company, is they have a, uh, a sales chart of AMC from 1970 through 1978. And um, so February of 1970 is when they made the acquisition. And in 1970, Jeeps were 14% of all of AMC's sales. Um, by 1978, Jeeps were 41.7% of AMC sales. And it just kind of like slowly keeps ratcheting itself up. Um, 1978 would be uh, another year where they, they start to struggle. But again, it's, you know, the imposition of the, the emission standards. Um, this is another instance where you start to see a crossover where AMC has to reach out for help. And because the way the, the emission standards were written... Um, automotive companies had to prove that their systems worked flawlessly for five years. Um, and I think their their end date was 1975. Well, nobody could really meet these emissions. Um, you can credit General Motors with the catalytic converter, 
Um, and so by 1977, they had to basically, well, first off, General Motors, they had some sort of um, consulting deal with American Motors because they just didn't have the, the manpower, the R&D, the research department, the engineering um, to do it. But um, American Motor Company had to buy catalytic converters from General Motors, AC Delco division, uh, just to, to meet the standards that the government had imposed. And so if you think about that, General Motors, I think, was basically charging twice as much as what the part costs. So General Motors, even though they might lose a sale to AMC, they were still making money every time an AMC car was sold. So uh, I think that's just, you know, it's but you got to do what you got to do to survive. And Jason and I, we've talked off air that for AMC to make it as long as they did actually impresses us <laughs> as we've dug into their history. But um, we're, we're kind of getting maybe a little bit uh, out of sorts. But um, Jason, before I dig into the Myers Tippett management team, kind of the, the late seventies, was there anything else we needed to to kind of button up here up to about nineteen seventy eight? I don't. I don't think so. Like I, like. Uh, 74 was kind of the year where uh, names like uh, the Cherokee and the Wagoneers and some of their command, uh, what do they call them, Com uh, Comanche trucks and stuff like that started being produced. So, uh, you know, we talk about Jeep sales. They did, one of the things I read in that book or in, in the sections that I had uh, was that AMC did not specify which Jeep um, models specifically were uh, being sold. They just classified it as Jeep. So I think parts of those are going to be classified in with uh, some of the other models. So it was a good buy. It was, uh, you know, when they when they jumped in there and they bought out uh, Kaiser Jeep, uh, they brought a lot of good to the company by uh, in the form of sales. Uh, also, I just want to make a quick note to highlight that Jay Fraser is here, or Frazier. Uh, he is AMC Yellow Jack. Uh, I assume that might be on Instagram or somewhere thereabouts. Uh, he's an AMC guy, so welcome to the show. I hope that we're uh, uh, living up to the name a little bit here and giving everybody some uh, some good and some proper information. And so, as Jason and I have mentioned, both in part one, part two, along the way, you know, this really boils down to its its leadership. When you have good leadership, they had some success, and you have poor leadership, well, it truly showed. So, January of 1979, or well, actually, we'll back up to 77. Gerald Myers became becomes CEO, and then um, later there's uh, W. Paul Tippett Jr. Um, had to take his place as soon as October of 78 because uh, Myers got promoted to director of the board. But this Mr. Tippett Jr. came to AMC via uh, his last job before that was the president of Sewing Products Group of the Singer Corporation. So this guy knew his sewing machines uh, and was asked to now lead an automotive manufacturer. So maybe you could just tell how hard it was to just even find um, maybe the right candidate in 1978. Um, but he did work at Procter & Gamble and Ford previously too. So it's not like he didn't have any sort of automotive experience, but just, you know, kind of let that put that into perspective a little bit. Um, but at this point, they kind of, uh, it was time to cut, cut bait with the Matador. It was, sales were sinking. Um, Again, they had some debt they had to pay off, so they, they sold off a stamping plant uh, to Volkswagen in South Carolina. Um, they had to start buying some Pontiac Iron Dukes for their, their economy cars, for the Sprint and things like that. And the point is that the company kind of knew that they were already living in the margins, but now they had to live in the cracks, is, was a quote out of the book. Um, <laughs> so... Um, with that, 1978 gave us the first year for the Concorde. 1979, the next year, was the Spirit, uh, replacing the Gremlin. And then 1980, our, our everybody's favorite, the AMC Eagle, rolls out. And in each of these years, each of those cars, as they debuted, actually sold pretty well. It's just they couldn't really sustain success in a second year. And so that's really 1978, 79, 80 it's really the tipping point, and that's when French government-owned Renault Motor Company, it's actually got a longer French name, nobody likes the French, so we won't go into that, uh, comes, 
Yeah, for those listening on the podcast, can't see uh, our Canadian co-host uh, cock his eyebrow at me. So, um, I guess I should, wow. should pause and let you rebuttal. <laughs> no, no, you're doing a fine job. Now, once you take your foot out of your mouth, I'll let you continue with your little spiel there. <laughs> well, it's a little dry now, but uh, <laughs> no, it's. I mean, basically, by the time the 1981 model year rolled around, it was is basically the beginning of the end for the American Motor Company. Um, there was a disastrous drop in Jeep sales between '80 and '83. We talked about the um, how in 1978 they were selling 153,000 Jeeps, making up 41% of the uh, the entire sale. Well, that number dropped to about like 60,000 in the next three years. And so that takes us up to about 1984 when the XJ has to roll out. And that kind of is maybe AMC's last uh, defining moment before they have to go under. But the thing that Renault really wasn't really doing their job either. They really weren't uh, selling anything uh, in France under the AMC badge like they wanted. And again, this is kind of the end. They June of 1983, they have to sell off that AM general division that, that Jason talked about uh, for $170 million. They actually sold their headquarters in 1983, the building that they headquartered out of for $51 million. And then circle back around to much like, you know, in the late 60s when they had to try to offer a warranty like everybody else, well, they had to treat their workers like the big three. So labor disputes were a huge thing. And basically, that's that's about what puts a fork into, uh, into AMC. But I think where Jason wants to wrap things up, well, that's where the, uh, the old Pentastar comes in to, uh, to swoop in at the very end. Yeah, and, you know, we've... Not to kind of change the topic by any means, but uh, Lee Iacocca back in the early 80s and late 70s, early 80s, was kind of what turned around uh, things for Chrysler. And I think that the acquisition of AMC uh, it was one of those uh, kind of gleaning moments for Chrysler to be able to say, okay, well, we've got this now. And, uh, you know, we all see where Jeep is today. Uh, one of the highest reselling used vehicles uh, on the market is the Jeep Wrangler series of vehicles. I'm a used car salesman, uh, so I kind of know that. And, uh, you know, with this new Gladiator and all that stuff. So they've taken a lot to come from 1970 when they uh, when they took over Jeep and bring it where it is today. Uh, a lot of crap happened. Uh, AMC went under. Uh, Chrysler almost did, but then they kind of come out of it. So. You know, you can almost say that the Jeep was the saving grace for AMC to some to some degree until management just basically failed. Um, we, we've talked about it very uh, uh, quite a few times throughout this whole segment. Is that uh, the ups and downs of different management styles and 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 what some of these uh, you know CEOs wanted to see happen with the company? Some wanted big changes. Some didn't want any. Some wanted to just you know stay with the status quo. One thing that I've learned about the car business, even today, is that if you want to stay current, uh, you've got to be accepting of certain changes. So uh, whether that's technology um, or whatever that has to be, safety, there's a lot of things that we look at. So, um, you know, I've really enjoyed kind of going down this road with AMC. Uh, you know, we certainly would like to have your guys' feedback. And just by judging through what's going on in the chat, uh, we see a lot of guys still talking about uh, you know some of the inline sixes that the Eagles had were good, and um, you know some of the cars that they know people had over the years. We're getting ready to open up questions uh, from you guys in the chat. So if you have any questions for us regarding the whole AMC uh, two-part series that you want to ask us, go ahead and throw them in the chat, and we'll get to those as many of those as we can uh, before we end the show. So Grant, I think that we've pretty much tied up. Some of those loose ends, as far as uh, you know, where they came from and where they went. Uh, anything else that we need to add to that before we kind of, like you said, stick a fork in it? Well, as much as I wanted to pick on Renault, they they did get the uh, Motor Trends Car of the Year in 1983, I believe. Uh, I don't remember what year. I think it was 83, but um, it. Uh, 
they claimed 27 miles to the gallon city and something like 50 miles. Here it is. Must be the Renault Alliance. Yeah, there you go. 32, 37 miles per gallon in the city and 52 on the highway. So um, they did accomplish something. So, <laughs> but Jason, it looks like our buddy Sean has a, a question he wanted to throw out and is asking the both of us, what's your favorite AMC? So with that, I'll let you uh, kick us off. Yeah, so it's easy to uh, kind of jump on the bandwagon and say the AMX was kind of the favorite, and uh, I, I think that that certainly would be my favorite. It's uh, it's hard to get away from the styling of that. There's some people out there who are resto modding those AMXs and making them look pretty good. Um, again, Grant and I were talking off air. We're, we're kind of the oddballs and looking for those odd body cars, and uh, I really think that the Hornet series of cars, the two doors, the four doors, the wagons, uh, were some of my favorite. AMC cars. They were just ugly enough to be cool, and I think that someone like Grant or I could probably turn that table and uh, and do something with them. So I'm going to have to go with the Hornet. Yeah, and actually, you know, if you remember our guest, um, Ben Hermans from season, was it season three? Is he a season three or two guest? Three, because season three. two was the disaster. <laughs> <laughs> so, but his uh, Spirit of 76 series I did for Popular Hot Rodding Magazine um, featured in 1976 it so go go google that it's pretty stinking sweet um i think i would yeah i could do one of those probably but since J jason already went hornet route um i'll say gremlin i would there's also a green gremlin that um god what's that chassis company the uh, there's some high-end like pro touring scca uh chassis company hot rod shop or something it's something basically anyway they threw a gremlin on one of those, and it won, like, CarCraft Street Machine um, event of 2017 or something. Go find that car, because it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> we did have a question up there from uh, King Eric, the greatest of all, had asked, uh, Jason, could you start a car company called CMC, the Canadian Motor Company? Yes, I could. Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> You already got the. Uh, I mean, you've got the roots. Old yeah, I, I think. Sales. Yeah, I, I think when if you uh, if you really kind of look back and, and to take that that question just a, a little bit to the serious note is uh, there's a lot of things that I think people or somebody or a company could do to make a better car than some of the big three that are out there today. They each have a lot of good things going for them. Uh, some of them have reliability issues, some of them have styling issues, some of them have putting an old name on a new vehicle issues like the Blazer. But I think if we were to go and take some of the styling cues and the performance cues and uh, reliability cues out of each of those brands, I think somebody could come and do it. And I think you're going to start to see a lot more um, of those type of companies popping up. You've got Tesla, uh, who's really kind of making a big uh, gains in uh, reliability. They yeah, they had their issues when they first come out, but they're kind of you know moving past that and kind of becoming a leader in electronic or electric car technology. So, is there room for more domestic car uh, automakers out there? Absolutely. Um, is it is it going in the uh, direction of electric? Yep, probably is. Uh, we talked about the the Nikola Badger. Uh, I see some more renderings of that coming through, and I I, I can't wait. I'm not going to say I'm going to stand in line for one of these things, um, but that they're probably one of the best looking electric vehicles on the road. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, it seemed like, so a question had come through about AMC owning Harley Davidson. Looks like the chat kind of took care of that one. Um, man, there seemed like there's one topic that I, that I had there that I wanted to throw your way, Jason. But um, since we're getting close to the end, we'll, we'll shut down the questions from the, uh, from the chat for now. Um, as we look forward to upcoming content on both of our channels, what do you got cooking over on Old Car Guy? Well, we've got a couple of things coming. Um, one of them is today I did a first for the channel, and that was I made a trip to the uh, junkyard, and I went there to pick up a... Well, I won't tell you what it is. Uh, I, I went there to pick up a motor for a future project vehicle. Uh, the future project vehicle is something we don't even know what that vehicle is yet. Uh, but nevertheless, there's a whole story uh, behind this trip up there today, 
And that will be coming out on Tuesday's video, so stay tuned for that. Grant, what do you got cooking over at Stray Six Fan? Well, again, as you guys know, I'm not going to do another upload until I know I'm going to be firing up the Fairmont. But I do have good news to report. This last weekend, I got quite a bit of work done that it's basically ready to fire up. But somebody had asked me the question if uh, when I reinstalled my distributor, if it was at top dead center and pointing the... Uh, the rotor at cylinder number one and I got the things like mm, no just threw that thing in there so it's a good thing I haven't tried to start it um, for that reason so I got to pull the distributor back out and uh, correct that but that's basically the only thing standing in the way of giving it a fire up I actually on Sunday had someone lined up to come over to be my extra set of eyes during startup and um, I woke up that morning with uh, one coronavirus symptom the chills and i thought uh i shouldn't the fairmont's not worth it you know turns out everything was fine that that was it i had chills that it lasted that long but anyway um we've got a vacation coming up starting on um saturday for myself this is why i'm hosting the show tonight um because jason will be hosting next week to take my place uh because we have Excited to announce we have um, Dirt Lifestyle, a big-time off-road fabrication channel, uh, as our guest. Um, but I intend on meeting at least two other YouTubers on this trip, including uh, our buddy Frank Finelli, the winner of Bitch and Boot Camp, as well as our buddy Ryan at Boost Rodeo. So I, there will be some content out of this trip at some point. So that was a little long-winded, but... There you go. No, that's all right. And you had mentioned that we have Dirt Lifestyle coming up uh, next week on my channel. And again, the following week will be on my channel again, uh, where we'll be hosting Streetcar Culture. Now, we had mentioned before at the beginning of the show that he is from Australia. And uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit Australian. No, we won't be talking Australia. We'll be talking about Australian cars. And uh, we'll be having a little bit of fun with that. And I've already made some posts. Uh, about uh, some of that stuff so stay tuned and uh, we'll be talking a little bit about Australian about the Australian hot rod scene I guess or, or muscle car scene or Australian cars is what we'll be talking I don't know I'm just going off track here um, yeah so it'll be uh, we did two weeks on Grant's uh, channel we're doing two weeks on mine starting next week so Grant will be on vacation he may or may not be a part of the show next week uh, like he said it just depends on where he can get an internet connection I too am on vacation I've been off this week and I'm off next week so I've just been coming home uh, to do the show that's how dedicated I am <laughs> to you guys is to take time out of my vacation and be a part of the car guy and six fan show just like all of you well, I did want to say thanks before we close it out here to Novataz or Sean for uh, $5 in Super Chat. Um, whether you want to be entered in my giveaway or not, you are. Uh, that's how this works. So you get five entries towards the the Delta Flow 50 Series Flowmaster Muffler. Um, so thanks again for that. Uh, we're at 111 entries now out of 180. So uh, we keep keep doing performing pretty well there. Um, Jason, do you want to send us out absolutely guys uh, it was great uh, talking uh, AMC for the second time on this part two I hope you guys learned as much as we did and enjoyed the talk because we'd like to do it more on some different car manufacturers that are out there so having said all of that thank you for joining us thanks for being a part of the chat and uh, thanks for all the neat information in that chat and supporting us every week by being a part of the car guy and six fan show guys stay focused on the windshield not the rearview mirror we